Hey guys, welcome to another interview. Uh, today I have James Rickenbaugh with me. Uh, James, you joined my program, I think January 22nd, 2022. So this was now exactly a year ago. We we're recording this on January 25th. I guess just filling people in on uh, how was your situation like in the beginning? Let's start with that relationship first. How did that relationship look like? Well, in the beginning, um, before uh, in December, uh, before Christmas, I had this uh, understanding that I was in a, a happy place. I was happy and happily married and in love with my wife and thought everything was ho uh, okie dokie and going, going great. Um, and then on December 19th, she told me that she um, needed some space and was going to move out of the house. Um, and at that point, um, I was kind of hopeful that things would work out and that, man, these th thinking these kinds of things happen, um, we'll just give her some time. Uh, but it, it, in a, about uh, January 9th, I, she found out she had uh, moved straight in with an affair partner and was now living with the guy that we worked with. And, uh, at, and at this point, uh, I had, I was, I was dealing with everything very poorly. Um, I was not eating, not sleeping. I couldn't concentrate at work. Um, I went to my doctor. I got put on antidepressants. I was um, basically just uh, lost uh, at the time. Um, and that's when, uh, luckily, I found your videos. And uh, that's what got me uh, to join the program in a complete state of dis desperation. <laughs> So initially, it was more of a, so pre-2022, it was more of a taking your earnest bliss kind of state where you looked at your relationship, you didn't see anything was wrong. You thought everything was happy, you were happy, you thought she was happy, but then she dropped the, let's take a break and a bomb. Um, and at that point, I think, yes, it was devastating. It was a shock, but at the same time, you had a lot of hope there. You were saying, well... It's a break. It's no big deal. But then once you find out that there was an affair partner, she was already seeing someone else. That was when all hope was gone for your side. Uh, exactly. I mean, how done was she at that point in time? So I'm, I'm assuming that when she said she wanted to take a break or when you discovered there was an affair partner, I, I bet you did a lot of things to like talk to her, to convince her, to... I mean, what did you do to try to rope her back in at that point in time? I probably pulled out every uh, toxic face there was. Uh, I uh, I was definitely into uh, trying to manipulate her feelings, trying to uh, logic her into what we needed to do. Um, I actually convinced her to go see a marriage counselor, mm -hmm. uh, which we saw one time, and it was after she saw that we saw the marriage counselor. We left the marriage counselor, and she said, "I want a divorce." <laughs> At right afterwards, so mm -hmm. uh, uh, there was that was uh, about when I was like, "Well, this is over, right?" Um, I I knew that um, I'd been I I had just. I said, there's no coming back from this, but at the same time, I was already, you know, I was already making my excuses, right? I, I'm the victim here. I, she left me. I'm, you know, I'm the good guy. And, you know, I, you know, it's on her and it's her fault and all, and all the blaming that was going on in my head really was just, just to make me feel better. Yeah, because I was so I was feeling so miserable, and I was falling back on old behaviors to try to, to to try to survive through that experience. Yeah, tell me that. Uh, expand on what made you eventually get onto like antidepressants and anti anxiety meds. What was going through your mind? Because I imagine like that must have been a, such a turbulent time for you. Like, what, was the, what were the things that were going on in your head? Uh, what were the feelings like at that point in time? I think it was complete. Well, it was anxiety, panic. You know, it was the panic attacks that really, where I would have difficulty breathing even, uh, kind of be gasping and heart racing, and uh, that really had me scared. But um, 
even when it wasn't that severe physically, I was I was always in these mental uh, just my mind was just racing all the time trying to figure out what can I do? What can I, how can I, what, how can I fix this? I want to fix this. And I've got to, I've got to, I've got to convince her that she's wrong. Right. That was really all I was thinking about. And, um, and it was, it was at those times where, I mean, I was trying other programs. I was trying, um, you know, I'd been a member of AA for years. So I tried that program, Al-Anon, Codependence Anonymous, um, you know, several other uh, programs where I was trying to find solutions to how to how to get her back, right? How to um, when um, when I came upon your videos, and um, and uh, I decided to join because basically because I was desperate for some. I wanted to get her back. That yes. was why. So I think if I could break things down a bit deeper for you, do a play by play in a way. It's almost like a bomb dropped. Of course, your initial instinct, like everybody's instinct, is to hunt, is to, from that tethered place, is to go, okay, I'm going to logically convince her. I got to guilt trip her for away from not leaving. I got to give her some evidence of why leaving is a bad idea or why staying is a good idea. I'm going to maybe even play the pity card to play the victim and say like, whoa, how can you do this to me? And guilt trip her that way. And all these hunting mechanisms, not only did it create a lot of anxiety and difficulty on your part? Because like we mentioned so many videos, right? You can hunt, but the more you hunt, the more you actually push her away. And so when you realize like, I'm, I was trying to do all these things, but the more I do, the more she's pulling away. I think that causes a panic. It was just a cycle of that, the anxiety, right? Like that was going through your mind. But then at the same time, I was blind to that all, right? I'm blind to the motivations that are driving me and I'm blind to the impact that I'm having on her. I'm still blaming, it's you know, that, that it, I'm blaming her character at that point. Yeah. This is her problem. You know, I'll I'll be the good guy. And I'll, look, I'll take you back. You know, that kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of a joke. <laughs> so let's fast forward to now. So obviously now is January 25th, uh, 2023. How are things like now? Uh, start with your relationship first. How are things like in the relationship? Well, uh, we, uh, I guess, we are, uh, my my wife has broken up with her affair partner and she's got her own place. And um, we are, um, we just got back from Las Vegas for a, a week before Christmas. We took a trip together. Um, we are uh, working on home projects together. We're working on family issues together. Um, we're talking um, daily, um, and uh, it, things are things are really uh, in a much more positive place. Where um, feeling relaxed about things and and looking forward to the future again. Yeah. So as I understand, your situation was that she moved out because she was done with the relationship. And so she moved out. She probably got a lease somewhere and just like got her own place. And I think uh, there was a point, and you updated us in the Facebook group, there was a point when she decided to break up with her affair partner and then said to you, hey, I see your changes. I see how there's a future here. I'm actually going to go all in to this relationship because I've seen what's out there. I don't like it. I like what's in here. I like what this has become. Um, give us the timelines for that. Well, it's kind of a, uh, uh, over the, when it was about nine months, right? It was kind of a, a back and forth where I, I kind of, um, start to establish some safety and, and we start to feel this closeness start and then then I revert back to some old behaviors and so she'd go she'd go back and forth she was gonna gonna get her own place earlier and then um, uh, then I start feeling that uh, that was about March three months in I'm feeling really, I think I'm untethered because at this point I'm starting to feel normal. Um, I'm I'm not having the panic attacks. I'm starting to feel good about things. I'm starting to learn. 
um, how to handle uh, the nature of emotions and and take responsibility for my uh, my part in the relationship, take responsibility for how I'm feeling, and I'm and I'm establishing some safety with with communication. And she comes closer, and we start working together to get her her own place. And then she, uh, then I, in hindsight, I see that I kind of started getting. I wasn't quite as untethered as I thought, so she she pushed back and and she stayed at, stayed with him all summer, and then um, uh, then it was really at that point when she pushed away. I said, "What's what's not working here? I'm still in this uh, my own confirmation bias of of uh, of how I am." So I I I had I couldn't see that that my uh, selfish and my uh, self-absorbed behaviors were how they were even playing out in this situation mm-hmm. and um so i when she when she decided to push back again and and, and went farther away um i also decided to retreat inward it, it was like i had gone through the program and i had had gotten up to phase four and I thought I had this and I was feeling so much better. And then I, I had that failure and I realized, you know, something's wrong here. And I realized that I was conceptually knowing things, but I wasn't, I really had really absorbed them and I wasn't as untethered as I thought. And I needed to go back and, um, and do this program for me because I think as I was going through the program, I was learning things and I was, I was still approaching the first time through the program. I was still approaching the program. Like I've got to learn this stuff so I can fix her. Mm -hmm. And when I'm reading about FAE bias and I'm reading about confirmation bias, I'm all thinking about, yeah, this is her, this is her. I need to understand this so I can know how to deal with her. And then, and then it was like, when she pushed back and put and the distance pushed me back uh, for before summer, I, I kind of said something's wrong. So I, I did retreated inwards, and I kind of said, "Well, no, I I I see that I'm the one with the toxic behaviors. I'm the one who's got all these defense defensive self protection mechanisms that I'm 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 acting on, and I realized that." I needed to go back right. and start over so that I could approach the program from my perspective and learn how I could become different. So I think your journey, if I could chart it out, was you started down here where you didn't know much. In fact, you were going backwards. Then as you took the program at first, you understood the program, but in a very tactical way, in a very service level way where you kind of understood a little bit of what, what to say, what to do, what you should do. And like we say, right, you're kind of an amateur at that point. You master something until you can get a few things right. But you haven't mastered something until you cannot get it wrong anymore. It's not a programming. It's not a deprogramming yet. So you went up a little bit. And with that, your relationship went up too. But then she realized that, hmm, I don't think this is real. This is not legit deep changes because I, yes, I see him change in certain ways here and there, but I can still see a lot of his old self. I could see a lot of his old patterns. I can still, still see a lot of the mistakes. I can still see a lot of the old stuff rearing its ugly head. And so that's when she started to pull back again. Right. And that was, which is good for you because that was your, your wake, wake up call to go, hmm, something is wrong here because everyone's getting success. A lot of people are getting success. Why am I not? Why is she not believing my changes? And so you look back and you realize, hmm, I'm an amateur right now. So let me take the program again to become a professional, a real performer. And let me program this stuff. Let me look at all the blind spots that I may have, all the subconscious programming, and let me dive really deep. And once you dive deeper, it's almost like you have a second wave, a much higher wave. Mm -hmm. And that was the point when she saw that being consistent that's when she went, you know what? Screw this guy. I'm going to go back with James and let me, let, let me go all in here because now I, I can feel safe enough to trust in this guy because I can see that 
this is not just some fluke, not, not some tactical thing. This is his becoming self. This is who is becoming right now. Right. Because it is, it's all about really feeling it, right? I mean, once you, to know, you know it conceptually, but until you can feel it, you can't really be it, right? Yeah. And um, the old me, when something like that would have went wrong, would have immediately thought, you know, it's not me. What it's got to be. She's really toxic, you know. But the the because of this program, that wasn't my first reaction anymore. My first reaction when she pushed back was that I'm not going to be a victim. I'm doing something wrong here, mm. and I and and, and luckily, um, I had the guidance from the program to know exactly what to do because uh, I retreated inwards. And I and I and I learned the uh, to really really feel and become untethered to where I could feel it. Where you know it's like letting go a load and dropping these heavy this heavy loads. You feel this freedom, and you feel this uh, caring for another person in a way. Just just a mutual respect. A mu- you know she's not a possession. She's not mine. She's not. She's her own person. And to, to, to just all this, all these, um, just honest emotions just kind of started coming up and it was such a great feeling because I was a stoic robot, um, before the program. I, I, I clenched myself through every conversation we ever had that was of any critical nature, but, uh, you're right. Um, the retreating inwards and working on myself for, and I, and we didn't talk very much, just rarely and nothing about anything serious for about two months. And it was, it was after that two month period where she just says, she, she started, you know, I'm, you know, I want to come back. I want to get closer. Yeah. And and, so So it kind of raises me to my first point, (coughs) which is, kind of a big picture philosophy on what it takes to reconcile, right? To save a relationship. So there's always two approaches that people want to, like when you first joined the program, you wanted tactics. You wanted me to just tell you, hey, Jim, this is what you need to say. This is what you need to do. If you do this and say this, she will see that you've changed and she'll come back, right? That's a very tactical approach. And the other approach is, by becoming literally irreplaceable. Not just in getting the small things here and there right, but becoming irreplaceable, where your lowest default is to do actually the right things, to do the healthy things, right? Um, Tell me your journey from, from going from that tactical route. Like if you could, you know, push yourself back to the beginning when you were so tactically heavy, you cared so much about the tactics. Looking back at it now, it seems silly to even want that, to even like think that's the way to, re- to reconcile. But why did you fall into that trap of wanting tactics in the first place, you think? Ooh, good question. Um, I think it, you know, the, of course, there's always that urgency up front um, that, you you want to you want to just you want things to be better and and I think that my personal self is was one that um, I had this inability to to be I avoided reality because uh, the reality conflicted with. Um, with my perfect minds, my perfect product mindset that I had, that I couldn't make a mistake. I had to know it all. I had to be able to know what to do in every situation. So there was a lot of the, the masculine, you know, I'm in charge. I, I need to know how to do this stuff going on. It was only, it was only when I could, I could honestly look in, and that was because of fear. I was afraid of mistakes and, and, um, I had to, I had to really, um, become to where I, where I really do look at mistakes as a good thing 
today. And that was something that is not, and it's not natural for me. It, it, I, it had to be reprogrammed in my thinking because I had to be not afraid of it because that fear that would come up when, when I would feel threatened would cause me to react to protect myself in ways that just pushed everybody around me away. Yeah. And, um, so I think that, um, it's that, that my basic problem was the inability to face failure and mistakes in myself and think, think that I had really, to know everything. That's a really insightful point because I can, I can understand how that feels too. It's almost like, you know, you, you go through your whole life. And in your whole life, you go, you collect all of these paradigms of what you think is right, um, processes and protocols of what to do in certain scenarios. And so, for example, like for you back then, whenever your partner probably told you that she was unhappy, your initial instinct is not to go, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with the relationship? But let me try to fix it right now, right? Because you fundamentally believe that. Your, the foundations of who you are was good. That if something was wrong, then all you need to do is change, pull some levers here and there. And once you pull some levers here and there, you're going to be good because the foundation is strong. Right? It's almost like a business too. Like you go to a business coach, for example, and you're not making money. And you tell the business coach, like, tell me what's going on. Now, it's one thing for the business coach to say, you know what? You have a great foundation. You have a great business model. All you need to do is just change these few things and you'll be golden, right? It'll just like flip everything around. But it's another thing for the business to say, dude, you've been, you had your foundations all wrong. You got the wrong niche. You got the wrong messaging. You got the wrong product. You got wrong everything. Your whole business is crack. So then when you find that out, that's no longer a easy fix. Now it's like, oh, I've got a lot of work ahead of me. I've got a lot of pain ahead of me. I've got a lot of like reckoning ahead of me. I have a lot of effort and time and energy that I just spend to undo and redo everything. And I think what you're saying is it's hard for a man who always thinks they're onto something right to accept that, dude, this 10, 20 years, I've been going the wrong direction. I didn't even know it. And that was what causes the, that denial in the first place of like the tactical view only, right? Yeah, and it's and and you're successful in school, and you're successful at work, and you think it should be everywhere, right? But um, honestly, if you don't, ha if I didn't, if I didn't, wasn't able to change my mindset to where I could accept tough truths, resistances. Um, you know, mistakes, inconveniences as being expected and part and, and actually helpful, um, to feel that, um, I was immediately reacting, um, to protect myself. And those, those came out in arguments and that came out in trying to convince her that I'm right, uh, to change the subject. I mean, I could go a number of different ways of, of destroying any safety that she could have to bring any of these issues to me because that that i would i would capture every conversation she'd come to me i'd capture it it'd be all i'd change it to be all about me how is this conversation impacting me and i've got to make sure that i come out of this okay instead of the much simpler approach which you you your program has helped me to learn is hey when she comes to you if you can, you know, you're, you're calm because you're expecting, you know, problems, you're expecting issues, you're expecting, um, tough truths mm -hmm. and, and sh she can share it. Um, and you can make, just make sure you understand it, make sure yeah. you're listening and make sure you can make her know that you understand what she's saying. Such a much more easier. It's less stress. <laughs> it's less stress. <laughs> yeah. I want to, I'm curious about the way you switched from that state of denial, right? Of, no, 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 I'm foundationally very good. I just need to fix this few things to you finally admitting and accepting within yourself that, no, I need to fix my foundations. 
And that's going to be a lot of work. I need to tear down everything I think I know, everything I think I've built, because I realized that the foundation is, is faulty here. That's a really hard acceptance for a lot of men to have. What made you accept it? And, and, and before you speak here, here's where I'm coming from with this, right? Because you know, in our program, we give a lot of, a lot of people very, a lot of tough love. We tell it like how it is. If you don't know what you're doing, if you're going in the wrong direction, we will tell you, right? And sometimes uh, with people who are trying to sign on to the program, they come on with this mindset that you had, which is the, the proud mindset of like, no, no, I got the foundations right. Just tell me a few things to change. But then we are on the call telling them, dude, you don't want to change the small things. You got to change the foundations. Right? That's going to take a lot of work. Are you actually ready for this? And a lot of people get offended by that, right? I don't know why they get offended. It could be a lot of reasons, but they, they get very defensive on that. And they try to uh, fight with us to say, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. My foundations is good. I don't care what you say. My foundations is good. Now, you heard the same thing. But why were you not offended by that? And why did you, why, how were you able to accept that? Well, I think for me, it started with the, um, you know, I, when I first found out what was going on, I immediately responded as I always respond with a victim in town. And that was natural. That was kind of the, my, my gut reaction was, oh, well, you know, this is, this is something bad happening to me and it's not my fault. Um, and I, well, it was it was the same reason why I joined your program. Honestly, was because when I listened to saw your videos, yours were the only videos that that made me uh, under. I, I agreed with, and I could feel that I could do something about my situation. I was not a victim. Um, there was also a little bit, honestly, a fear of the, of the emotional turmoil I was in. I was terrified. I mean, I was having physical repercussions from my mental and emotional situation. And there's nothing scarier than being out of control of that. And, um, I think, think it was, it was, it was the, through the program learning that I am not a victim and that I, I am responsible for where, you know, my part and where this environment of the relationship had gotten to, I am responsible for my own internal condition. Um, and I need to get serious about doing something about it. Um, because as long as I kept blaming, I wasn't going to fix anything. I didn't have to. Uh, but but that wasn't working, right? There, I, I could say that, and I could, could try to get by with that, but this time, it wasn't working. It, the, the the victim mindset wasn't making me feel any better. I was I was miserable. I thought, you know, so you know, I think I was kind of felt like I was kind of forced into a corner. But honestly, I think it all started with. Uh, uh, once you know you're not a victim, you have to start looking inward, right? What am I doing? And 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 I saw in my history uh, uh, that that had been the case going all the way back to my first marriage. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's interesting because like I look at my journey too of my relationship or being an entrepreneur as well, and I take a look at the moments when I got rid of that victim mindset. I got rid of that denial that I had. And what was the thing that got me to out of my denial? I think it's a couple of things. I think one is very externally based. So, you know, I always put myself in a, in big masterminds, right? I pay a lot of money to be in just massive masterminds with people who are earning seven, eight, nine figures. And if you surround yourself with people who have actually done it like that, done the impossible, done what you think is impossible, and you realize that you're not doing that, you're not accomplishing what you, what you want to accomplish, and other people have, 
that's the point where you no longer have any excuses, right? Because it's almost like, imagine, you know, you are a runner and you're trying to run the 100 meter dash in under 10 seconds, right? You could argue all day long that like, oh, I can't run at under 10 seconds because of this reason, of my handicap, of my build, of my height, whatever it is. But if you start to see hundreds of people with your same handicaps, with your same height, with your same whatever excuses, and they are busting through despite the fact that, despite all these things, and you are still failing due to the same reasons, then you have to go to yourself and go, hmm, what am I missing? You can't go like, at some point, you exhaust your excuses, right? Mm -hmm. By just looking at what other people can accomplish. You exhaust it. That's the first wake-up call. The second wake-up call is also coming from an internal place where if you have repeated uh, the same bad patterns many times throughout your whole life, at some point you realize, this can't be other people anymore. This has to be me. I got to be missing something, right? And at some point, again, you exhaust your excuses. And unfortunately, sometimes what I accepted here, James, is we need to let people feel the pain, watch the world themselves, and we need to allow people to be embarrassed by their own performance, by their own self. And we need to let people exhaust all their excuses before they're willing be, be, like before we can help them even like we won't we don't we won't enroll someone unless we know that they have exhausted the excuses they don't have any unique circumstances and illusion etc right they don't want to tell their stories all the time only then do we onboard them but before then it's like you're not even going to listen to me anyway you haven't felt enough pain <laughs> right agreed it's such a it's such a heartbreaking thing for me to realize, but at the same time, it's liberating because I used to, in the beginning of my business, I used to try to help everyone. If people are like being difficult, they're being stubborn, they aren't doing the work, whatever it is, I'm like, let me try to convince them to do the work. But now I'm in a position where, you know what? If you want to do it your way, if you can't trust my way, do it your way. Run off the cliffs. Once you're tired of breaking your bones, come back. We'll be here, right? When you're ready, we'll be here. Mm -hmm. And I think that was what you felt too, where you wanted to do it your own way at first. You kept running off cliffs until you decided to surrender and you go, oh, now I get why Jeff says this. <laughs> I still say that. It just happens. Uh, uh, it's, it's like there's certain things that you don't get until you go through them yourself. Um, and even now it's been a year, but uh, there'll be something that'll come up in my life today that I'll go like, that's what he meant about. <laughs> you know, I, I recently come to realize why it was so hard for me to break into that was that those, those uh, perfect know-it-all um, uh, wiring was was really part of my identity, was really part of my core identity. And that's why if, if anything gave me an indication that that wasn't correct, such as a tough truth or resistance from my spouse or a mistake at work or what have you, it really shook me emotionally. And, and it shook me so emotionally because it was such a part of my identity that I was actually very scared inside and, and it caused me to act defensively. So until you, until you can actually see that and, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it, I don't know. It's, it's, it, it, once you see, see that you can start to see how all the, uh, all your illusions and all your toxic faces are all tangled up there together. And, and, uh, uh I mean, I was at, FAE bias against myself and, um, or, or I guess that's self-flagellation, if you will, yeah. is a big thing because, uh, but I, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm rambling here, but. No, it, there, I think you're onto something because, you know, 
as you know, the thing is, the thing I've been thinking about more is as our program gets more and more successful, more and more rich, et cetera, it polarizes people more, meaning that the people who are there who are humble, like yourself at a point in time, or humble or willing to do work, they get amazing results. All right. You, you have made friends with a lot of the people who have gotten amazing results as well. But there's, of course, like a, a, a subset of people too who they join this program and they never surrender to it, really. They never really like say, let me just blindly trust Jeff because like he's done this thousands of times. I haven't done this. I haven't done this even successfully one time. And they struggle to surrender to it. Like, I'm starting to understand that, again, there's nothing you can do about those people who are, will who are just not ready to surrender, not ready to, to do the work, because they still want to do it their own way. I mean, if you look at the people in, those pro in the program now who are in that category, who are not doing the work, for example, is there anything that you would say to them that would, like, Kind of wake them up a bit. What do you tell yourself to wake you up to get out of the, that denial? Wow. The um, gosh, it's I. I you know I, I I don't know that it was any one thing. It it seemed like if you're honest with yourself and you're, and you're doing what the program recommends, you continue, I continue to bump up against my, my problem every day. And I think it seemed to me to be that I, that just a little bit of, um, n not any one thing. It was, it's all of it. It's, it's when I think back to how all of this program fits together um, from, you know, how the, how the emotions are, uh, work and how I, I need to stay with them and understand them so that I can, so that I can reprogram them, the, the, the way, the interpretations I make on those events that are happening to me, um, to understanding the different illusions that I didn't even realize were illusions, right? I mean, I thought they were truths and, but it, it, it's like, I don't really know, Jeff. It seems like I, I learned through pain like anyone else and I learned from mistakes today. Um, and I make little mistakes every day in the program, you know, you, you, you but you, if you if you stick with it, you know, and you don't run from those mistakes or start blaming the program or start blaming someone else, um, and you you just keep, um, you just keep uncovering more and more about yourself. And I really think that the mo the biggest one of the biggest problems that I've seen in, in the people that I talk to that have problems is. is they they skip the uh, internal shift, or they they don't think they're important. And I I have to put myself in in that boat at first too. I I kind of went through them and thought, yeah yeah I get it I get it. But it's really when you when you uh, when you do realize that you've got to do that part for yourself, and you start to see the the you know. I was I had these problems long before my marriage and and I brought these problems into the marriage and and we start to understand them and you and I can't thank the program enough because it's given you given me the roadmap and the and the principles and to to evaluate those things but um yeah I think, I think that I think for me there's and you tell me this is kind of along the lines of what you're thinking. To me, there's two things that really prevent people from like getting the success that they really are looking for. Number one is that unique circumstance illusion. They think their circumstance is very unique. Right? It's, it's really funny to me when people like send them to the program, for example, and what they want is they want to tell their story. Right. And I always wonder with that, it's like, Okay, so 
what do you expect to happen here? Let's say you tell your story to me or to a member of my team. And do you expect it to say that your story is something we've never heard of before? No. <laughs> we've heard of every case, so okay, so... <clears throat> Telling your story is, is useless in that sense. Like, we're never going to go, oh my God, that's crazy. I don't know. That, that, that's so unique. We never, we have never said that once after 50,000 conversations with people. 50,000. Right. The other thing too is I always ask them, okay, let's say you tell me your story. Does it still, does it, absolve you or does it let you escape from the fact that you need to build safety? No. Does it let you escape the fact that you need to build admiration? No. Does it let you escape the fact that you need to build alignment or sexual passion? No and no. Does it let you escape the fact that you need to learn the frameworks to actually converse properly in your relationship? No. Does it change the fact that you need to become bulletproof? No. Does it change the fact that you need to become untethered? No. Does it change the fact that you need to uh, play non-victim or stop your fundamental attribution error? No. Does it change the fact that you need to build your self-esteem? No. So if you telling me your story doesn't change anything that you need to do, doesn't change the treatment plan one bit, then what is the point? What is the point, right? Your story isn't unique. No matter what your story is, if you build the five pillars, if you build the three layers of changes, you will get your results. That's it. You will become irreplaceable. And just like your story shows here, once you become irreplaceable, it doesn't matter how hopeless you think you think your situation is. It doesn't matter. They will come back. Because when you become irreplaceable and they realize that I cannot find anything close to this anywhere else that I look, doesn't matter anymore if they want space or not, whatever it is, right? And the second thing I think about too is when people don't do the work is again, they have all these excuses that they have, right? But, well, those people can do it, but I have this issue. Well, I have this issue. Well, I have, I have that issue. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know how many more, how much more evidence we can give people. Right. Every two weeks, we have a deep interview with someone like you who went through something very hopeless. And we show you in every single instance, sure, the details of the situation may be unique, but no matter how unique it is, so it's the same diagnosis, which is lack of safety, lack of admiration, lack of alignment, whatever it is. And the reason why you cannot create safety, you cannot create alignment, whatever it is, is because you are not bulletproof, you are tethered, you are um, paying victim, you have the fundamental attribution error. It's the same diagnosis. It's always the same diagnosis. And with the same diagnosis, it's always the same treatment plan. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you pause there for a bit, Jim. That wasn't good. <laughs> hey, Jim, just uh, turn your screen again. Perfect. Uh, we can just cut out that part. But again, like what I was saying was, uh, sorry for the intermission there. Nothing changes, right? The, the diagnosis is always the same. With the same diagnosis, you have, always have the same treatment. So you take, imagine there's a pill. Okay, the pill was like, you take this pill, it doesn't matter what sickness you have you'll be better. There's no side effects to it. The side effect is that you've got to take a pill. If that pill can fix everything, then what is the point of going to a doctor and say, tell me what's wrong with me? Who cares? Just take the freaking pill. You know, <laughs> who cares? You know. Yep, I, uh, I have found that so many things that... Um, to be true like that, I mean, from the different stages of, uh, of relationships, you know, and how we move from, uh, codependence through independence to, and 
noble selfishness and noble independence uh, ha has been so helpful because um, I can see and I know you know you know you talk about the pillars and and the, the the progress for surrender to each of those is the same so it it's uh it's i'm just amazed at uh, how many things in this really deep program apply to everyone i talk to you know in the program right i mean because it's like you said it's we all come from different backgrounds and have different different tweaks to our stories but we're all we're all the same and in fact it's by getting in touch with the internal shifts in the program I, it even helps you understand your partner better because they're the same too right they're you you if you really understand your internal mindsets and workings you're in a much better place to understand someone else's mindsets and work working so I agree completely with what you said, but the, that, and it amazes me every day that how how many of, of a program so rich and deep and long, all of it applies. <laughs> Everything applies. But yeah. so I want to talk talk through this uh, notion of the paradox of change real quick, because you went through what we call a classic paradox of change, right? Which is that when you try to change people will resist that change. So for example, when you try to show your partner the here, for example, hey, I'm changing, I'm becoming better, what does she do? She pulls away, um, right? She makes things hopeless for you. And I think that's the shame that a lot of people don't understand is that when your partner tells you it's over, that's not when it's over. That's when things just began, right? Because Again, let's put yourself in your partner's position here. Your partner has stayed with you for a very long time. She's been unhappy for a very long time. And throughout this unhappiness, she's always like telling herself, well, here's the reason why I should stay. Here's the reason why I should stay. Maybe uh, James can be better. Maybe he will change for one day. Maybe the future can be better. So she keeps like lying to herself that things are going to be better. And each time she tells herself it's going to be better, she gets disappointed. Hope, disappointment. Hope, disappointment. Hope, disappointment. So when your partner tells you it's over, that's when she's basically saying, you know what? I've been fooled way too many times by this false hope. I'm not going to be fooled once more. I am done. Right? And so when she makes it hopeless for you like that, she's actually giving you a massive opportunity. And that opportunity is, if let's say, okay, if your partner tells you it's over and you still change, you become better, you become a different man, you still go on your growth journey, your partner will eventually go, hmm, I don't know, I've taken every ounce of hope away from him. <clears throat> he has no incentive to even change, to do better. But yet he is. That's what's going to change your partner's mind and go, hmm, maybe, maybe there's onto something here. Maybe this is real after all. I mean, there's no incentive to fake the changes at all, right? But let's say you promise your partner that you're going to change. You're going to change. You're going to change. And she tells you it's over. And you give up. You say, oh, whatever then. What's the fucking point? What would that tell your partner? She was, you, she was right about you. She was right about you. That all your promises to change was all conditional. It was, you were so easily swayed in that journey. Your intentions for changing is very unknowable. That once the catalyst for change goes away, which is that maybe she comes back, you will go back to your old self again. Because you fundamentally do not enjoy, you do not like, you do not value the act of changing itself. And that's the biggest shame when I, I see people like applying for the program sometimes and one day they're like super hot, then the next day their partner tells them it's over, then they're like, whatever then. Like, dude, you don't understand. When she tells you it's over, 
the game just fucking started. And if you give up right then and there, you just told her everything she needed to know. And you just confirmed her decision to leave. That is the biggest shame. Were you tempted to do that throughout the whole journey? Well, at, at first she was so, if things were so unsafe, she was afraid to tell me all that stuff that, uh, you know, because at first you're pushing, I'm changing, I'm changing. Look at this, look at this, I'm taking this class, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, because you're trying to push it. She she said, I, I didn't want to discourage you, or, you know. But uh, by September, when we were having the discussion about uh, that she that she decided to, to uh, that she wanted to, to try again and, and make our relationship work, um, she actually sat there and described the paradox of change to me that and has never seen any bit of that in the program she said at first i said she said i didn't think you could change but i didn't want to discourage you because i knew you were trying to do something good and then um she said that all the talking about change just made me want made me wanted to get out of there and then uh you know, we didn't talk about it, but you know the uh, the part of the program where you're where you're really empowering her to explore and to find out what she really wants for herself. Um, she said that she said that's when I knew you were changing because that's not you, <laughs> that's not the old you, and I consistent I consistently fell back on that, and I consistently encouraged her to 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 speak and and find what she needed for herself in fact when she said that she wanted to um to work on our relationship i said wait i know how long you've wanted to be single you've got that opportunity right now i'm still working on me said let's just you be single for a while and just just do that. Do it with all your heart. And um, it's, uh, but um, the the point at which I almost gave up was when, uh, right uh, in April, I'd been in the program the three months and I had had that little, um, you know, where I thought I knew it all, but I really didn't and pushed her away. And, and I, I was working towards helping empowering her get her own place and she she ended up uh, taking some assistance and then within two weeks she says i'm going to move in with him for good and we're going to have a committed relationship and i was like <laughs> i said okay i'm uh, you know i almost i almost gave up but that's when i turned inward and i dug into the program i went back and restarted i i doubled down on the internal ships and uh it, it made all the difference yeah yeah because again like for your partner's perspective she's not doing this like on purpose right it's more of i want to see how james would act when he cannot fake what he's doing anymore right so it's almost like again you know sometimes there's the science experiments right we say oh let's get all the participants in and we tell them you are this this uh, experiment is about this for example. But the experiment is actually not about that at all, right? What the scientists are trying to do is they're trying to see, okay, if people know they're not being judged on this one criteria, if people know they're not being studied, what would they do? So there's a classic one where people were uh, supposed to just like, like I, I think the study was saying, you're supposed to sit down in the room and you're supposed to just like sit down there and watch some numbers, right? And solve math equations for a very long time. But the study wasn't actually about that. The study was when people run out of patience, what do people do? How do people react? And so all these people, they're watching the numbers and then some people what, when they run our patients, they go fucking crazy. What is this? What the fuck is this? I don't want to do this anymore. Right? And it's like, 
they think they're being guided and judged on this one thing, but they're actually judging on this other thing. And so the same thing with your partner, right? Like she wants to see what do you do when you can no longer fake things anymore? What do you do when you think no one's watching? What do you do when you think no one's judging you? So she'll tell you sometimes it's over. But when she tells you it's over, that's actually when the experiment begins. That's when she begins to watch you, right? And she'll watch you. Do you go to your old self, back to your old self, or do you continue with your new? If you go back to your old self, we'll know, okay, that's his, that's what he does when, when he thinks no one's watching, right? Yeah, her confirmation you, bias. Right, but when you can be your, your new self, she'll go, oh, that's what he does when no one's watching. Right. And, and it proves right again, right? Like your partner now looks at you and go, when she told you it was over, she, it wasn't over for her. That was when she started watching you. Right. She's got this confirmation bias that all the, I'm doing all this just to get her back, just to impress her, just to try to make her feel like she can come back. And so she, you know, she takes away a little bit of hope and you, you show your best side and you say, I'm empowering you and let me know how I can help. And I'm here for you if you need me. And, you know, I want you to figure out what you need and, and do this. Right. And, uh, I mean, that just, it, if it wasn't for that one thing, I, my relationship would have been over because I would have fallen back into the, she's toxic. She's a, it's her fault. I don't have anything to do with this, but yeah, uh, that a mindset really changed my life. But again, it goes back to that notion of what it means to become irreplaceable, right? Being irreplaceable is not becoming someone who just understands the tactics here and there. You know, you have to become that person to be, to, so that the right things become your lowest default. Because the thing is, like, a lot of people understand the tactics of what to do. For example, they understand the conceptually right now, when your partner tells you it's over, you definitely should double down on the processes. People conceptually understand that. But... If you have the victim mindset, if you have the FAA bias, if you're not bulletproof, if you're still tethered, when the actual, actual moment comes, when she tells you it's over, right, you're not going to perform well. There's no way you cannot fake it because the, fun, the fundamental is that she wants to know what you do when you absolutely cannot fake a tactic anymore. That's yeah. the ironic part, right? So... That's not only the importance of being untethered, but also the importance of being a performer too, to the point where you master something not until you can get it right, but until you cannot get it wrong anymore. And that goes not just about the things you say and do, but all the internal processes, all the internal like thoughts, all the internal feelings. You got to fix all that stuff first. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you also mentioned earlier how a lot of people, they skip the internal shifts. Why do you think people do that? Why did you do that? I did it because I was still thinking that um, I needed to figure out what I needed to do to fix her, and she was the she she was the one with the problem, and that I had I was the victim. Uh, I was gonna show how good I was and stay uh, in the relationship and try to reach out and help her, mm -hmm. and it was. You know, as I found out three months later, when I thought I was feeling better and doing great, that, oh, wow, I'm, I'm the problem. And what did you realize that you were the problem? Like, because, okay, if you look back with 2020 vision now at who you were before, like you were falling for the victim mindset, you were falling for the FAA bias, you were falling for tetheredness. I mean, so many issues there. Now you look back and you go, oh my God, I can't believe I thought I was good. Right? I can't believe it. Like, I would laugh at that. But at the beginning, you didn't realize just how bad you were. Why is that? Like, how can you be so blind to that, I guess? Well, it's like, you know, it's just like the program teaches us. Um, we develop these confirmation biases about ourselves and about the and paradigms about the way things are and we don't even think about them anymore we've already settled the issue in our mind that uh, i'm not the problem i don't make mistakes and um you know and 
whenever anything to the contrary comes up, we're in defensive mode and we're playing defense and we're 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 protecting ourselves and and it's it's very habitual, right? I don't think a normal or at least me before I found your program, I never considered all the choices that go on between the event and my behaviors. I, it was just kind of a reaction to my confirmation, personal confirmation biases and paradigms. And I think, um, the, the really when it still gets back to that question and it's a good one, cause I'm not sure exactly. I know, um, uh, when I saw that I was responsible but it was when I thought I was doing everything right and doing things new and was still not getting um, the outcome I was shooting for that I realized that, you know, this is, I could, I could see that I started to see that all those reactions to um, being wrong, not having the answer, making mistakes, entropy, um, her, her uh, her di uh, disapproval of me, all those things that were hard for me to accept were were real and that were a consequence of the way I was acting. Mm -hmm. But um, it I think was... to me, there's like different levels of of unawareness, right? So you could be aware of the problem but you could be unaware of the solution. So aware of the problem, unaware of the solution, right? Uh, you could be, the next level up is you could be aware of the problem, aware of the solution, but unaware of how to get to the solution. But then you could be on the opposite extreme where you don't even know the problem. And I think that was where you were at. It's like, you don't even know FA bias was a thing. You don't even know victim mindset was a thing. You don't even know um, like, tetheredness was a thing. You don't even know that was even a problem. So if you don't even know that was a problem, you can't find a solution. But if you don't know it's even a problem, then you think you have this false sense of you're awesome, right? It's like the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? The Dunning-Kruger effect says the less a person knows, the more awesome he thinks he is. Because if you know very little about a subject, you have no principles by which you can critique yourself. You know, like, like if you look at like, um, any skill in life, right? There's always like a very interesting study. You can look at this up on YouTube, right? The Dunning-Kruger effect. And whenever people will talk about stocks, we talk about, uh, music, we talk about business, the people who know the least about business, the least about stocks, the least about uh, relationships, even they will always rate themselves as very high on the scale of skill. But when they actually were given the test, their skill was actually very low, right? So they overestimated by a lot their ability because again, they don't understand the, the criteria by which you can judge yourself. Right. But then you also have the sensations in life when, you know, you, you first come up with like, like you try to learn stocks, for example, and you get overconfident, then you get into it and you realize, oh, this is very complex. And you feel like at first you don't actually, you know, actually less than you think, you know, and that's what's, what's happening there is that you have learned the judging criteria by which, what makes a great stock investor, great people, great relationships. So once you know about these things, you can't unknow it anymore. Kind of thing. You know, I was also able to look back and see that, you know, my first marriage en ended similarly, um, and they, and there's really no connection between that marriage and my current marriage, except me. Right? And and I look at all my relationships. I'm pretty introverted. I I ha I I don't have a lot of friends, close friends. I don't. My, even my family's kind of like standoffish. You know, I, I realized that I didn't just have a problem with my marriage relationship. I had a fundamental problem all the relationships in my life. Yeah. And that's when you can't escape that reality. Yeah. It's not like <laughs> you, you're the common theme behind all of this, right? Um, I want to also talk about how 
he doesn't take to do tango. And that's like the number one myth that I always would like to bust in a way. Right? Because like here's another story. We have 50 plus now. We are almost like 60 something. We're over 60 uh, plus interviews right now where it all always starts with one person, in this case, the guy trying to save the relationship and their partner is not wanting to save the relationship anymore. They don't even want to try anymore, right? And the same thing with your case. And I've been getting like a lot of comments on, on my YouTube channel and stuff saying like, why do you always put it on the men to do something? Why doesn't the woman, shouldn't the woman do, do something too? Well, what we're saying though is like, first of all, we coach men, right? And if I make a video, let's say, that says, you know what? I'm talking to you men and you're struggling in your relationship, but you don't need to do anything. I want you to expect your partner to do better. That's a shitty advice because you can't do that. That's not an actionable advice. But what we're saying here is we're saying, no, change yourself. And once you change yourself, you can then change the culture of the relationship. Once you change the culture of the relationship, you will be surprised as to how much your partner's behavior changes as well. And I think that's exactly what you saw. Right? You change yourself, mm -hmm. you became irreplaceable, you change the culture of the relationship, and once you change the culture, she starts to draw back in. And now so, all the behaviors of wanting to get out, all the toxic behavior that she had, probably a lot of them goes away, and they continue to go away every single time. You create that safety, that culture, et cetera. <clears throat> That's the pattern you're seeing too, I'm guessing? Correct, yeah, it's the same as the, all the, it was like one of the most common that bad advice you get uh, from the people before I joined the program. And even after, when I talk about the program with other people outside the program, you know, that, well, it, you know, don't beat yourself up. It's her, it's her, she's got, she's, it's her par pr problem. You can't do it without her. You both got to try. Um, you know, it, it was all that, um, you know, she, well, she, you know, what's a cheater, always a cheater. All those, that same bad advice that uh, if you follow it, um, I never realized, I didn't believe it. I know before I met you that I did not believe that it, I always thought it took two to tango, but, um, I've seen it happen in my life. I've seen, I've seen myself make real changes in myself and I've seen, I've learned skills that help me to reverse the, the negative feedback cycles going on in our relationship to improve the, the environment, uh, between us. And I've seen what that does to another person's attitude. And, and like you taught us, I mean, it's the, you know, the, the environment was the reason why things got so bad in the first place, right? It was, I wasn't aware of the negative feedback cycles then, but I was, I was sure pushing them the wrong way. And it was that that led to her inability to talk about the problems that we had and, and, um, that led to her. Uh, being trapped and hopeless and, and need to get out. Yeah. But what a lot of people don't realize too is like, whether you know it or not, even for people who are listening to this, you are defining, you are playing to the feedback loop no matter, regardless of whether you you realize it or not, right? Like, let's say your partner comes home from work, she's angry at you for something. And if you decide right then and there to respond by getting angry back, you just, what you did just determine what she did, which is she going to get even angrier, right? But if you can catch that and you like change the script to a positive script, you just change her behavior. So this whole notion of you cannot change your partner is fucking bullshit, right? Because you're always changing your partner. You're always either enhancing or changing the script of a negative behavior, for example. In this case, all you're doing is just you're unknowingly perpetuating a negative cycle. You just don't know about it, but it doesn't mm -hmm. change the fact that you're still perpetuating the negative cycle, you know? Right. It's, it's really funny. Yeah. Um, a, wise, a wise man once said that, mm -hmm. uh, that it, uh, if you do something or you don't do something, you're automatically either reinforcing or, or reversing a, a feedback. feedback cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you are, and that was me, I think. And even if you're aware of it or not, even if you're aware of it or not, right? Even if you're like, well, for example, like a great example is like, 
if let's say my partner tries to tell me something you know like the other day she said to me um hey jeff i don't i'm not sure i'm i'm into like family things anymore she said that right and for a lot of men who are very oblivious to this, they'll just go, well, okay, I'm sorry to hear that. Or like they might not even think mu much of it, right? So even if you're not aware that right there, a stimuli comes in, you have a choice to do something, to do nothing, to do good, to do bad. Even if you're not aware that that, that choice is there and you choose to do nothing because you're unaware, you are still perpetuating the negative loop. Right. Um, well, what I said in that, in that example was, I said, oh, Tony, look, I guess like, I guess I can understand that given how your grandfather just died, given how, um, your parish, your parents' marriage are going the way they're going. And sometimes like we do so much for them, but they don't really re respect what we do, et cetera. I can understand how you can feel that. And guess what? she started to talk to me about the deeper things, the deeper reasons why she doesn't believe in family anymore. And at the end of the day, we realized that it wasn't just about she doesn't believe in family. She doesn't actually mean that. It was something deeper than that. But that event was an event where she brought something negative. I spun this to a positive. And now that was an event where we look back on it and we go, that was a lot of safety created, a lot of trust was created, a lot of healing was created that was a very beautiful moment from something so small something so negative that a lot of people can see as negative right and that's what people don't realize people don't know people don't have the internal shift to be able to hatch the negative feedback loop turn it around and then have the frameworks the external skills to be able to guide the conversation to make it a positive for her as well people don't have that and that's a shame you know and it seems like you have that, but, but I want to end on this, uh, other one, which is this notion of having real power in a relationship, right? So you mentioned earlier that one of the biggest moments for your relationship was when you actively encourage your partner to explore that other relationship or to explore being single. And in fact, when she wants to come back to you, you said to her, you know what? I know you want to come back right now. Let's slow it down. I know you want, to be, you want to be single for a while. So this is your time right now. Let me empower you. Let me give you the freedom to do that. If you were to tell that to most people, people will think you're actually crazy. But what's, what's your reasoning? What, what do you tell yourself to be able to do that? Well, it's about um, the knowledge that if she's going to make a decision, she has to fully surrender to that decision. Um, and if she's still wondering about whether that, that particular person, other person, is, is the person for her or whether she'd be happier single than in a committed relationship, um, if, if, if she's still got that in the back of her mind, she can't fully decide and surrender to come back with her whole being and jump in. Um, that's, that's the honest truth. And I know it wasn't intuitive and you taught me that, but, um, I believe it now and I've seen it work. Um, and I see that it's a very, um, people, people appreciate, um, being respected and empowered. They, yeah. they, 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 you know, what I want is one thing and what she wants is maybe something different. She has to figure out what she really, really wants. And unless she really, really wants the same thing as I do and to move forward in this relationship, um, I really don't want her to sacrifice and do that, right? I mean, it's just, it's not going to work out well for me in the long run either. You know, it's funny you, you say that because... People think of reconciliation as like the number one thing that is like the ultimate goal. But to me, it's like, we need to go one step beyond that, which is mutual reconciliation, right? Because most people think reconciliation from the, their own perspective. I want to be, I want my partner to come back.
but they don't really care about what their opponent wants, really. Um, so I think for a lot of people, when and you, back then for you, you wanted to reconcile. And so if your partner were to come back to you and say, hey, I'm ready to come back now, you would go, yeah, 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 come on in. <laughs> come on in. <laughs> but then you don't realize there that, yes, she could. there could be the label of her coming back, but what you don't realize is there could be that unspoken thought in her mind of what if, what if, what if, what if I explored? What if this? What if this? And so that's where we get fake reconciliation, right? Where people come back together and we get so many clients from other programs who went through fake reconciliation and they realized that that wasn't reconciliation at all. The only reason their partner came back was because maybe they were scared of leaving. They were scared of the uncertainty of leaving. They were like, uh, this is not the perfect relationship, but it's good enough. But they're always, the the back, yeah, the label is there, but they're not fully there in their emotions, their heart, their soul. They haven't fully surrendered to it, like you said. And the thing is, if if you're just looking for reconciliation like that, then you're always going to be sleeping with one eye open. Because you don't know. Like, like you don't, like, like I bet when she came back the first time and you didn't, you weren't sure that you were irreplaceable, like truly ir irreplaceable. I think there's a lot of fear in you to go, okay, I'm getting the good results now, but I don't know what will happen in three months, six months. I don't know if I can sustain this. For all I know, like next week, she might just change her mind again and go like, fuck this, I'm out. I don't know, <laughs> right? But now you have that assurance and that assurance again is bred by that sensation of knowing that of all the people in the world, you can create the most safety, you can create the most admiration, you can create the most alignment, you are the most bulletproof, you have the best frameworks, you are, you are the most untethered and hence non-needy, you have the highest self-esteem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're not having the highest of those things, you have the best process to get you there. That is real confidence, right? And I would say too, only weak men are unable to give their partner enough freedom and empowerment to explore being single, to explore other people, only weak men. Because weak men, they know that if their partner explores the world, they'll find something better. But for me, it's like, explore. Look at other guys. I don't care. Flow with other guys. I don't care. You're going to come back. I know. Nobody competes at, at, at this level. That's the only place in your life where you can feel truly powerful where you can feel truly secure, where you don't have to sleep in one eye open anymore. That's true reconciliation. That's what we strive for in this program, right? Right. You need to understand that. Now, I want to end this by talking about your experience in a program a bit. So you joined a lot of other programs before joining mine. Why do you think those other programs didn't work and why mine <laughs> Well, I, you know, I think I, I, I can't really say they wouldn't have worked because I think I was still looking for, in the most case, I was still looking for a quick fix mm -hmm. um, when I was running through a lot of them and I didn't give them all very much time. But what I can say was that your program okay. made me feel empowered, like I can do this. I don't need, I can do this by myself. I can do this, you know, this is mine. I can do this. And, and it's within my power because my whole problem at the, at the beginning was I was, I was the victim of everything, you know, and I was out of control and I couldn't do, that was why I was feeling so badly. So your, your program told me that I could do this. And so I, 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 I chose your program. And then I think there was, there's a bit of financial investment and that made me stick with it a longer than maybe I, the others were not as expensive and were, you know, but I, honestly, I think it, it's just, uh, it was the reason I chose it was that was the empowerment it, it made me feel. And the reason why I stuck with it is because it resonated so true mm -hmm. and it resonated with my experience. And as I, I grew and made mistakes, 
I'd, I'd see that, see that in the program. I'd see where, I, where I went wrong. I said, oh yeah, Jeffrey said to do this. <laughs> I did do that. So, <laughs> so it, uh, it kind of just, once I was in, it just kept, it just kept reinforcing itself with, uh, with, uh, I mean, honestly, my mental map is, has the answer for most of the, anything that comes up in my life today. I need to go there and 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 find it, and it's and it's uh, it's amazing testament to you and and all the effort that and experience that went into putting it together, be, or this program together, because I have yet to really find run into a problem that the answer's not in there. Yeah, I mean, w- between the group and you and and uh, and and uh, and the program. Uh, it, it gives you, it gives you the structure. It gives you the um, principles and the and the uh, skills and builds the skills that I, I need. So, um, I think it's just a, the success is what's kept me here. Yeah, good. Um, I gave you a lot of tough love in the beginning, a lot. I remember, like, there were some moments, James, when I look back at our conversations and I had a few sleep. Sleepless nights because you would message you something, you would make a post, and I would be super harsh with you. And I always go back to my partner and I would go like, oh, was I too harsh? I don't know. <laughs> was I too harsh? I don't know. What role did that tough love play for you, you think? Well, um, I think the, the, it was, it was good. It was good because, um, for me personally, because of my, my biggest problem is coming out of my shell and exposing myself to the possibility of failure, right? And the possibility of not knowing the answer, the possibility of not have, uh, being the best at whatever I'm trying and the potential for failure and all that was really the core of my weakness. And so, um, I think there were a few times when at first I would be like stung and like, oh, oh, oh and I'd be like, <laughs> but, uh, I don't have, it's all water under the bridge now. I think it's, uh, I think it's all good. It was all another, just another step in learning that, you know, Hey, um, there, I don't know it all. And I came here because I needed help and I need to learn and learning comes from mistake and, uh, st- having someone who can point those out to you is really something to be grateful for now. Um, and I just didn't have the uh, BPV at the time it, early on. Right? Take it, yeah. You know, it's interesting you say that because, like, that's my biggest struggle as a coach, right? It's so my evolution of thinking is kind of like this. So I want to give people what they need. Right. And tough love is very important because if I see someone who isn't able to take tough love, for example, who to take like what they really need to hear in the way they need to, to be heard. Right. It tells me that that person is in extreme denial, like where you were, right. Where you, you know, you had issues, but you didn't want to see it. And when someone has the courage to actually give you the issues right there front and center to you. You smell it. You smell the stench of it and you go, fuck that. That's not me. How dare you insinuate that, that, that that's me. And then it comes like a ego thing now. But if you look at your life and I always ask this question to people because I'm always the youngest, younger one of any interaction, right? <laughs> I was asked like, how is it that you are 10 years older than I am or 20 years older than I am and you managed to learn less with more time than I did? Is it because that whenever life tries to give you a lesson, gives you what you need to hear, your ego is so fucking massive that you reject it. That's why you never see lessons. You just see confirmation that you're awesome but you don't grow from that. You grow from seeing how you're not awesome. But every time someone tells you you're not awesome, you get angry at them. 
So how can you learn? Right? That's how I say, um, so I'm glad you took the tough love well. Because that to me, like when you can take tough love well, that's when I know that this person is serious. This person wants to grow. This person has no ego, right? This person wants to grow. So at that point in time, right, I used to give tough love to everyone. But then now, I only give tough love to people who want to take it. So for example, like when I give tough love to you and you react well to it and you grow despite it, I'll say, this guy's fucking serious. This guy's here to play. And I will give you more tough love to allow you to play more. <laughs> but if I give someone tough love and they can't take it, I'll just like say, you know what? You're not ready to play. So you do you, right? Let life give you the tough love that you need. And eventually when you're you've broken your bones enough, you come back. That's totally fine. Um, so for people who are in the program or whoever, wherever, right? If someone doesn't give you the tough love, that means they don't care. Either they either don't care about because they don't care or they don't care because they don't think you have the potential. So if you get tough love, embrace that shit. Mm -hmm. You need that, right? Because you're however many, how, however old you are, you haven't learned the things you need to learn. There's a reason for that, you know? And I'll end with this too. It's one of the hardest things for me to do to give tough love, James, is because like, you know, uh, I always get to the analogy of the, the hospital, right? So part of the reason why the opioid crisis started is because of the hospital thing, right? Like, uh, yeah. like people, patients go to hospitals because they want to avoid pain. And so these hospitals, what? They will give you extra painkillers. Overkill the pain because they want that good review. <laughs> right. Right. And I, I, I battle with that too. I could just let people slide, be nice to everyone I see, be nice to everyone I meet and go like, mm, whatever, just so that I can get the happy people, good reviews, but I might not get results. But I would rather get people results, get people what they need. And sometimes that will get me some hate. It will get me some resistance. That will get people to like, don't like me. I don't give a shit because all I care about is like, you came to me for results. I'm going to give you results, right? You didn't come to me to get a pat on the back. You didn't come to me to in intensify your victim mindset. You didn't come to me to, to, to have someone tell you like in a nice way, oh, you're doing a great job. You came to me because you want results because you are sick and tired of getting pounded by life, by your partner, by your relationships. And the, the thing I always say is like, let me pound you in a program where, so that life doesn't have to pound you. Let me wake you up in the program so life doesn't have to wake you up. Because when I wake you up, nothing, it's not painful. But when life wakes you up, that's usually divorce. That's usually some really bad things that are happening that wakes you up. What do you want? Like, think about it, you know? So I might raise some bad reviews here and there. I don't care. I'm just going to go my way. Because the people who care, the people who are ready to play, will play. The people who are not ready to play, they won't play anyway. Doesn't matter. And the preponderance of people in your program, we need, we need that, those tough truths, right? I mean, we, we've got, mo uh, I bet a, a high percentage of the people in your program are come in just like me, blind to their um, ego, blind to their... Um, situation where to their ability to admit their own mistakes and to to face them and learn from them um I'm, so <laughs> you know the fact i think that you, you're up against a, a a crowd that's uh probably against you from that from that perspective right you know that's interesting you say that i talk about this with samantha a lot um and you know to be honest james there are weeks or even months sometimes when I question, do I want to keep doing this? Do I want to keep doing what I do? And the thought that comes to my mind is that, you know, I'm not teaching entrepreneurs. I'm teaching 
sorry if you get offended by this, I'm teaching the lowest of the low. I'm teaching the people who are, who, whose wives literally left them. Like, you think about this, right? Some people have been married 20, 30 years. Like, think about the financial loss. Think about the loss of the children, the loss of family stability, the loss of 20 to 30 years of history, memories, experiences, the loss of going into something unknown. Some, uh, you know, women go out and be single in their 40s to 50s. That's scary for women. But this man has made someone so miserable that they're willing to take on all those costs to just get the fuck out of there. And I'm the one trying to teach those men. These are not men who are on the average. These are men that are way below average, right? So sometimes like dealing with those people is tough. Like the level of toxicity sometimes, the level of like stubbornness, the level of denial, the level of just bad thinking is very high, right? <laughs> um, it takes a lot of patience. <laughs> Um, so I do question whether I want to keep doing this or not sometimes, because it's just like the nature of the people you're dealing with is just was difficult, but cases like yours, where once in a while I can do the impossible and I can change these men and make them into someone from bottom percentile to the top percentile. This is why I do what I do. This is, this carries me. Right. So thank you. I want to just thank you for doing this and people who are, and people who are listening to this, um, in the program who are considered like a players, thank you for doing this. Right. But just understand that if you, if your wife has left you like that, you need to do some internal reckoning because for your partner to decide to leave despite all the costs, you got to think about how miserable you made her. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> so, um, closing words, uh, you mentioned also the program is a very complex program. It's long and so on. But now that you look at it, right, um, from a completed standpoint, do you feel like it was actually difficult or how would you describe it? Like initially when you see the long videos, the many parts of the growth that you need to have, it seems very daunting, right? Were you ever daunted in the beginning? Were you ever like, oh my God, this is too high of a mountain to climb? And no, I think there was a, I wanted to get through it because I was still shooting for an outcome, right? I think, you know, I got to get through this so I can get what I want. Mm. Um, but if you, if you can, I think the, the one piece of advice is that if you just do it step by step and don't worry about, you know, make sure you have it, you know, know it, move on, know it, move on. Um, you'll, it, it's always additive and you're always, it's, it goes together in more complex ways. The more you learn, um, you under have a deeper and deeper and deeper understanding, but the best part for me was that very early on, there are some things I needed to know mm. right out of the gate, you know, you know, victim mindset, you know, FAE bias, you know, all those things, you know, being tethered, the illusions, you know, all those things that I didn't know about. It, 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 it was, it was interesting and made sense. And it wasn't, you know, if you just, if you don't get hung up on where you're, trying to get an outcome out of it um it goes very easy so i think most of the problems were me at first um then after i got through it once and i'm going back through it again it's even more beautiful <laughs> it just starts to things start to fall together in, in ways that you didn't see the first time and i'm sure it's going to continue like that for some time for me yeah and i think that's the 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 thing that i can sympathize with a lot of people right because I think when you sign up to a relationship program, 
you come in thinking your learning is going to go a certain way. You're going to learn this in the sequence. You're going to learn this methodology, whatever it is. And then I just turned it upside down and I said, you know what? For the first four parts of the program, it's not even teaching you how to say anything. The first part is teaching you how to learn. Like you got to realize that you're this, how are we already old, m m many years old, you haven't learned what you need to learn. There's something wrong with the way you learn, right? And this is not learning some technical things. It's learning some very soft things. So you've got to understand the different way of, the, of learning there. Then I talk about untetheredness, which has nothing to do with the relationship, but it's everything to do with your internal state. Then we talk about the bulletproof vest. And I think when people see that, they're like, what does this have to be with, with, with relationships? But what you're saying is like, just stick with it it will click. And when it clicks, it will click in more ways than you can imagine. And what, like, your initial thinking is you will get this. No, just trust it and you will get much higher than that. Yep, exactly. Um, I, I, I put it that I had to establish emotional safety within myself mm -hmm. before I was capable of go, reaching outside myself to to create that safety within the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so it makes perfect sense to me. And it, it's the way it played out. I was not getting anywhere till I made that inner peace with myself, understood, forgave myself, understood what, how I was, how my toxic behaviors were, uh, were really due to a, me being a bad character, but me trying to protect myself, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and so I could, so I could not self-flagellate. So I could move forward, uh, and it's like you said. What the um, there aren't relationship problems. There's personal problems that expose themselves in your relationships, right? Right, right. James, I'm so proud of the growth you've 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 had. Right. Um, I remember in the beginning, just to be honest with you, because I think you signed on with uh, Jared, right? Jared Lou brought you in, and Jason at the time was the coach in the community. Yep. And I remember Jason sending me messages occasionally and him going like, this gym guys, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if we can make it. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to do it. <laughs> and I just told him like, look, man, like, you just got to let people run off their own clips. And then once they're ready or they're tired of it, they, they come back. <laughs> and lo and behold, you did. And I'm so glad you did. Um, whatever you're getting right now, you deserve it. So you should be proud of yourself. Thank you. You went from the bottom percentile to the top. That is very hard to do. A lot of men can't even take the first step of having even the humility to do that. Think about that. Think about how many things you've had to like overcome in yourself to get from bottom percentile to top percentile. That's a lot. So be proud, okay? Thank you. Still got room to grow. Always. Gonna... Never no, yeah. never finish line, right? Yeah. And like I always right. say to my clients too, like, beat me. Try to beat me. Beat my bulletproof vest. Beat my outsideness. Beat my frameworks. Beat everything right, that I do, right? I want you to surpass me. That's hard because I'm also going really fast. <laughs> You're still going up. Yep. Thanks, Jeff. All right, guys. So just to wrap this up, if you want to explore a program that literally gives you everything you need from not only the right principles, that will often run counter to what you will hear in other YouTube videos and other programs, but will actually get you the results that you need. If you're looking for a program that only gives you these principles, but also has a community of people who are playing at a very high level, like James now, who are willing to motivate you, to show you how it's done, to show you that no situation is unique. If you're wanting to have a coach that actually will prioritize your results over your feelings so that you can live the life that you want, then check out the masterclass. It's about an hour and a half, the masterclass. We'll show you the system. We'll show you a bit of our culture. We'll show you a bit of how the program works. And at the end of the masterclass, we'll give you an opportunity to apply for the program if you want to. So uh, before we leave, James, here's what I like to ask people at the end. 
if you could, if you're standing in front of yourself, a year, like the version of yourself a year ago, what would be the one or two things you would tell him? Well, the, the, the first thing that I think has benefited me the most was that, um, uh, you, you got to stop playing the victim. You got to take, uh, you got to take control of what you can control. And, you, and I had to, um, I guess if I, I would just say, you know, don't be afraid of, of your own mistakes. Um, they're really a gift and, um, you have to feel that you have to become that to where you, you feel it. You feel that you're grateful for those. Mm. So number one is like, don't play a victim. Don't assign problems that you are facing outside of yourself. Don't blame your partner. Don't blame your friends. Don't blame your childhood. Don't blame your, yourself, your body, uh, your predisposition. I'm depressed. I'm anxious, whatever it is, take control, right? Take back your control. And once you take that ownership, you'll realize that life is going to start giving you a lot of lessons, very tough truths, very tough realizations, very difficult things that you have to face about yourself, some shortcomings. When they come, don't resist it in whatever way they come. Embrace it because those are massive learning opportunities that will prevent you from experiencing the same cycles over and over again, right? Right. Like what I always say is like... Uh, you can ignore reality, but you cannot ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. You can ignore the reality that you are flawed, but you cannot ignore the consequences of it. And most people who are watching this video, right? Yes, doing the work is hard, but you know what's hard? What's hard is getting divorced. What's hard is losing decades of your life to a marriage that didn't work out. What's hard is repeating the same pattern over and over again for your whole life. That's hard. I bet it's hard being where you are right now, right? So one hard, if you do, do the program and it's, it's hard, but it's going to pay off later. If you don't do the program, it's easy now, but I bet you it's going to be continuing to get hard in the future. Choose your hard. All right, James, thank you so much for going over. That was an hour, 46 minutes. Wow. <laughs> Time flew. Yep. Thanks. All right, James. Thank you so much. Um, Keep inspiring the people in the program. I know you inspired a lot of people, so keep doing that. Uh, I want to see you more in the program too. I want to see how high you can go, okay? And beat me. I want you to All go. right. All right, man. Thanks, Jeff. Bye. Bye.